morning, everybody. Good to have everybody here. Um, we're, we are starting a, um, a new series this, uh, this morning. Quite excited about doing this in collaboration with Willoughby Church, CRC Church just up the road on 200th Street at the top of the hill. And um, it's a, a series on the book of Acts, the last part of Acts, uh, speaking truth to power, witnessing uh, in the shadow of the empire. And so I've been um, doing this in collaboration with Mark Glanville, who's a pastor at Willoughby. And um, yeah, it's, it's been really good working with him, and um, I think I find in him a kindred spirit, and I think uh, you, I know that you'll be blessed by him. So today is Thanksgiving, and um, we, we want to be especially mindful as we worship this morning that um, of our call to be thankful recipients of all that God has provided. So if we'll stand now for the call to worship, if you could please speak the bolded parts on the screen behind me. Our help is in the name of our God who made heaven and earth. Amen. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music upon the harp. How good it is to celebrate God's presence. Sing praise throughout each day. Our God rebuilds the people of earth. The wandering ones are gathered together. The brokenhearted are healed. The hungry are fed. The prisoners are freed. The blind are given sight. The lonely are befriended. All of nature sings aloud the goodness of God. Clouds, rain, grass, creatures great and small. Our God creates and sustains our world with his ever-growing, never-ending love. Grace and peace be yours in abundance to the knowledge of God and of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.
इसलिए When I was um, a kid, we, I would sometimes go to a, one of my friend's house, and after supper on Sunday afternoons, they had a tradition of going around the table and saying, "What are you thankful for?" And I dreaded it every yeah. time. I would forget that they actually did that until after supper. The father would say, "Okay, now we're going around the table." So I want us all to do that um, this morning. Uh, it's a very good uh, tradition, I think, especially being Thanksgiving weekend, uh, for us to to be mindful of what we're thankful for. And uh, I'm not going to go around and ask everybody, but anybody who is willing to uh, express what they're thankful for this weekend, uh, to just uh, shout it out. The weather. The weather. Who is that? Yeah, I'm thankful that we have uh, our neighborhood here. Yes. People are getting to know it's pretty sweet to see them, so it's great. Thanks, Andrew. I'm really thankful that I've survived myself long enough to realize the things that I thought were suffering have become purpose for me. Mm -hmm. And a chance to see all of you made me feel like that really is true for me. So thank you. That's good. Thank you, Jay. Yeah? I am thankful that I got to have a sleepover with my best friend. Oh, nice. It's Joey's last birthday today. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. I'm thankful to be able to have a Did he? Yes. Great. Nice. Great. Here, I'll see you. I'm thankful that God has now decided that I'm at a point where my kids can come back into my life. last night, and all went well. It was a great celebration. So, thankful that my, my couple of my aunts are here visiting because of the wedding. And my uncle. I'm thankful for recognition. There's um, one other twist I'm going to put into, into this now, and I'm going to ask that um, if you're comfortable, the things that you've spoken that you're thankful for, it's one thing to, to say to each other what we're thankful for, and uh, it's another thing to take that and say it to God. And I think uh, it's one of the, the joys we have of being a Christian when we have this feeling of thankfulness, we can direct it to our God. And um, if we can do that now, I'll, I'll begin the prayer, and then I'll uh, leave some time for silence so that people can just give their expression, repeat their expression of thanks to God Himself. Okay. Let's pray. God, you alone are worthy of our praise and our worship, and it's so good to sing this uh, in the presence of your people, uh, people that we're in community with. Uh, thank you for this gift that we have as a church, to, uh, that we don't worship you alone, that we worship you together with others who love you. And I pray for the communion of saints that together, as we worship, we may be pressed on holiness and in witness in this world. So we come before you, God, uh, with all the good gifts that you give to us, and uh, we have this praise and thanksgiving on our lips, and so will you now hear the praise and thanksgiving of our lips. Father God, I just want to say thank you for, uh, for putting us in this neighborhood, Lord. I want to say thank you for finally, after all these years of, of hanging out here, we're starting to get to know our neighbors, and I'm thankful that they're here. Just pray that uh, we can continue to just to grow and uh, just to be able to eat together, to be able to talk together, and, and just to be able to, to exist together. And I just want to say thank you so much for the blessings of those people that are here this morning, and I pray that you'll be a blessing to them.
God, thank you for Joey's ninth birthday today. Thank you for AJ, the, uh, that she is in this amazing place of being thankful for the suffering journey that you have brought her through. Uh, thank you for the witness of this, uh, this maturity, of being able to look at her own suffering and looking at it all in the journey that you brought her through, for her to be in this place where she's actually thankful for this journey. We praise you for AJ, and we ask that you continue to bless her as she continues on her difficult journey. And thank you for Penny, that she uh, she's in this place where her children are coming back to visit her, and uh, will you bless their relationship uh, with her daughter, and uh, bless the daughter's pregnancy, that uh, there will be a healthy uh, baby, and uh, that you would that you would give uh, these. Uh, these moments of celebration for them as a family. That's Penny. And thank you for Jennifer, that uh, she is uh, just getting to know Jennifer. She's uh, new to this community, and I pray that you continue to bless her as she gets to know different people in this church. Thankful for her presence here with us. Lord, as we continue to worship, we ask that your hand would be upon us, that we would feel and know your presence, and take great comfort in you. Amen. <laughs> the children can go to Sunday school. They're going to continue to worship downstairs. Um, I have one thing to say before we go downstairs uh, for Sunday school, is that, uh, especially for the parents who bring their kids down, if you haven't been downstairs yet, there's been a door installed in the hallway. And the idea there is that uh, you need to sign your kids in. And it's important for you to know that whoever signs the child in needs to be the person that signs the child out. And so if you can just be aware of that as you go downstairs. Thank you.
you could turn in your Bibles to Acts 18, that would be great. That is on page We're going to start at verse 23, and I'll uh, get to there in a moment. Just a first a word, uh, this series, um, so this particular message, if you can have the slide up there, is uh, uh, <laughs> like a train on the edge of town, the truth that challenges the powers. And so this, this, that's what this series is about, about challenging the powers of this world, speaking truth to power. And the truth is that God has established his reign on earth, and he rules with power. And it's important to remember I think that to remember that whatever power in this world that we stand in opposition to, it's important to remember what Ephesians 6 reminds us of. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other humans. But it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And as we track with this theme that it's evident in Acts, beginning in Acts 18, find that the very first power that God publicly challenges is the power of the dark forces in this world. The evil forces that stand behind every other earthly power that stands in opposition to God. So we'll get there today, but first I'm going to set up this series and explore this good news truth that challenges today's powers. What is this truth? And for this we turn to Acts 18 verse 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. And if I could just pause for a moment to say that, why are we starting here on verse 23? And it seems kind of an arbitrary place to start a series. And uh, the reason is, is because this is where Paul begins his third missionary journey. So Paul went on various different missionary journeys. This is his third missionary journey. And so that's where we're starting this series. And um, this third journey really is Paul revisiting some of these churches that he's already visited. So he's going back. And so he sees Paul's heart for strengthening the churches that he planted. So let's continue to read. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus... So Ephesus is this place that Paul had already planted and he left. And he left Ephesus with this married couple, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. And they were, they were to be leaders in this church. So Paul had left. Paul's going to come back to visit. But first Apollos stops in here. So Apollos is a native of Alexandria. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately though he knew only the baptism of John, that's John the Baptist. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They invited him into their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was of great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road to the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. 
but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating, they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now come and came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. So he sent two helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. And about that time, there arose great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver <coughs> shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the skilled workers there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business, this business of making idols. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There's danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who was worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. I'll stop there. So there's a lot of dark stuff happening in Ephesus. Demons and idols that are being challenged by Paul and the kingdom of God. And it's significant that the principalities and powers text that we find, that we find from Paul is found in Paul's letter to this place, to the Ephesians, the people in Ephesus. So all this happens in Ephesus. Apollos, uh, Paul rebaptizing these disciples, these amazing miracles, casting out of demons, riot in Ephesus because Paul destroyed the idol making business. It all had to do with the kingdom of God setting up shop in a real city among real people. It all has to do with the truth of God being present, challenging the powers that oppose Him. So first, what is this truth? We have two stories back to back, Apollos and Paul baptizing these disciples in Ephesus. And both Apollos and these disciples only knew the baptism of John. So in both stories, something is missing. Luke's intention here is to make a clear distinction about where we are in history. About where in history, where we are in God's plan of redemption. He wants us to know that the Holy Spirit has come into our midst already now in power. And the truth and power of the Holy Spirit's presence already now is challenging the powers of this world. This is not something that we have to wait for. This is something that is now. And John the Baptist preached a message of what? Repentance. A message of prepare, prepare the way for someone, for something that is coming. Prepare, repent, get washed up. The king is coming. And Luke, with these two stories, is saying that someone, that something, has already come. He is here. So it's almost like Luke is saying with these two stories, let's get with the program, people. The Holy Spirit is here. So um, 
I'm going to take us first through this story of Paul and the disciples and then go back to Apollos. So, so Paul runs into this group of disciples and asks, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul baptizes them. They begin speaking in tongues and prophesying. It's like they had a little mini Pentecost because they missed the first one. And this is the only instance in the New Testament where we see rebaptism. And it's sometimes used by Christians to speak of a post-conversion or a second blessing to say that you, you can be a Christian but not have received the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And so there's this, this baptism of the Holy Spirit that we can have sometime after we've already been a Christian for a while. I volunteered at a uh, street ministry once. By the way, I am hopped up on decongestants this morning, so I might just keep this glass of water right in my hand. Uh, I volunteered at a street ministry in Abbotsford. It was probably about 15 years ago. And it was a ministry that had different people volunteering from different denominations. And one guy there uh, that I volunteered with was Pentecostal. He figured that I needed a second baptism once he found out that I was Christian Reformed. And um, he, he, well, he clarified, first he asked me if I spoke in tongues, and I said no. And he asked if I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said, what must have sounded like to him, I haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. So he informed me that he could baptize me with the Holy Spirit. He could do it right now if I want. And um, to which my response was, you know, I'll think about it, and I'll get back to you on that. And I remember uh, telling Rick Watts, the prophet regent, this story. He was very Pentecostal. And uh, he said to me, and all he said was to me, uh, I am so sorry. <laughs> um, the problem with using this story to make a case for a baptism of the Holy Spirit as some kind of second baptism is that these disciples that Paul meets up with aren't Christians. This isn't a second Christian baptism. The baptism they received first was John's baptism. When Paul baptized them, that's the first time they are being baptized into the name of Jesus. A Christian baptism is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is no Christian baptism that is not a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Whether infant or adult, when you are baptized into the name of Jesus, it is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. So there's no need to get rebaptized unless your first baptism was illegitimate, as it was for these disciples. And it was illegitimate only because it wasn't in the name of Jesus. And this is the most uh, peculiar group of disciples. Uh, who They received John's baptism, so presumably they were John's disciples. But it's hard to believe that they were even John's disciples. It's hard to believe that John's disciples would ever say, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Because John the Baptist's main message was, I baptize you with water, but after me will come someone who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That was his main message. So it's hard to believe that they were even John's disciples. It's hard to believe that they weren't even familiar with Jewish scriptures at all. Anybody, any Jewish person would have heard that there's a Holy Spirit. The prophecies in Joel just to mention one place among many in the Jewish scriptures, promise an outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the end of the age. I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And Christians believe that this is precisely what happened at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came upon them, but these disciples apparently didn't get the memo. They haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. So it's hard to believe that they even knew their Jewish scriptures well, let alone whether they knew John the Baptist's teaching very well. So what's likely is that these disciples received some kind of knowledge of John the Baptist's teaching in a second-hand kind of way, and were not baptized by John himself. And so what Luke is doing here, uh, it appears, is showing the full spectrum of John the Baptist's followers. John the Baptist had an amazing legacy uh, in his day, and even up to the 3rd and 4th century, had an amazing legacy, and there were many followers of different stripes, and Luke appears to be given a bit of a spectrum here, with Apollos and these disciples. Apollos, who we'll get to in a bit, had very knowledgeable, very, uh, even spoke about Jesus accurately, and you have these disciples who didn't even hear that there was a Holy Spirit. So there seems to be 
um, a full spectrum that Luke is touching on as the church in the early years transition into this era in which now the Holy Spirit has broken into the present, what John the Baptist foresaw and prophesied. This is the truth that these disciples were missing, is that the Holy Spirit, the Kingdom of God, is a dynamic power that's already amongst them. So Paul baptizes this group of disciples into the name of Jesus, and a little mini Pentecost happens. They speak in tongues and prophesy. Pentecost catches up to them. They receive the Holy Spirit. And Luke draws a clear similarity between this group of disciples and Apollos. But at the same time shows that they're not alike at all. In fact, the only similarity between them is John's baptism. So if we can go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, you're way ahead of me. Wow, that's... <laughs> sorry. Uh, so Apollos is presented to us as a uh, learned man, uh, very intelligent, well-spoken, thorough knowledge in the Jewish scriptures, been instructed in the way of the Lord, which in Acts always refers to the salvation of Jesus, he taught about Jesus accurately, and yet he only knew the baptism of, of John. So very, very odd combination of facts about this man. He was fervent in the spirit. He's been instructed in the way of the salvation of Jesus. He spoke about Jesus accurately, and he only knew the baptism of John. Luke gives us that heads up. Something with Apollos is missing. Something is missing. So what could be the implications of Apollos' ministry if he only knew the baptism of John? And it's significant, I think, that Priscilla and Aquila later, they don't see a need to rebaptize Apollos. They must have assumed that the Spirit was upon him. So Apollos appears to be a Christian, but yet something is missing. He began speaking boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila heard him they invited him into their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. I love that. If you find that I'm up here speaking boldly, uh, that I'm missing something, I prefer that you tell me the privacy of your home rather than standing up and yelling in the assembly. Um, or as opposed to you and your company ripping me apart like the bunny that you're having with your suit. I think I like what Priscilla. I like that Priscilla and Aquila's approach here of inviting them him into their home and explaining to him the way of God more adequately. And whatever they taught him clearly had something to do with only knowing the baptism of John. So as if Apollos is baptizing people uh, or persuading people, sorry, to Jesus. It would have been confusing if he only offered them the baptism of John. John's baptism was one that indicated the coming of the kingdom as a future reality, the, the outpouring of the Spirit as a future reality. But the kingdom was already here. The outpouring of the Spirit had already begun. And because Apollos offered John's baptism, it revealed that he may have still been living in a Jewish paradigm and not a Christian one in regards to understanding the Kingdom of God in the presence of the Spirit. And I found the way that Mike Goheen explains the Jewish and Christian concept of the Kingdom of God very helpful at this point. In Jewish thought, he says, the Kingdom of God is an eternal fact. The Kingdom endures forever. His Kingdom is there, waiting for humans to submit to its ways. The Kingdom comes to us through human acknowledgement of God's rule. But the kingdom will also come in the future as an end time event. Then God will act in power and cause his rule to appear throughout the whole earth. In the present though, according to Jewish thought, we can, we can still experience God's rule, God's kingdom, but God's rule waits on human decision. When humans submit to the way of God, then we see God's kingdom actualized. In the future, God will act sovereignly in power to bring about His rule. And the way Goheen phrased that just actually rocked me. It, 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 kinda, it made me realize I slip into that way of thinking all the time. I slip into the Jewish paradigm all of the time. I drink that Jewish water, if you will. And as in God's kingdom is an eternal reality. 
One day, God will move decisively to bring his kingdom to earth on, with power. But until that day, how do I experience God? By lifting my awareness to his presence. By being intentional, by learning the way of God, and deciding to live in accordance to those ways, by putting into practice the will of God. And when I and when others submit to God's ways, that is when God's kingdom comes to earth. God's kingdom comes to earth upon human decision, upon the human will to act and act it, to put it into practice. That's the Jewish paradigm? What's the Christian one? Of course, I, I know the Christian one in my head, but I slip all of the time into this Jewish paradigm concerning the kingdom of God. So what's the Christian paradigm? And it's like the Jewish one in that the kingdom of God is eternal, but as N.T. Wright is always fond of saying, what the Jews thought God was going to do at the end of time, God did in the middle of time. In other words, with Jesus... God began to move that future kingdom, apart from any human decision, apart from any human will. God de decided to begin moving that kingdom like a train, into, breaking into particular places. God, through his, through his Spirit, is establishing His rule, His reign in this world. And it's this rule that comes to us like a train coming into town. A power that we have no control over, a power that brings us restoration and healing, a power that challenges all the powers of this world that stand in opposition to it. With Jesus, the kingdom breaks in with power. And that's the truth that is missing when we only know John's baptism. With Jesus, the kingdom breaks in. The Holy Spirit, which the Jews thought was going to be poured out at the end of time, was poured out in the middle of time. And it happens with Jesus. Jesus breaks this kingdom onto earth. He comes crashing onto earth. And one of the things he says that really drives this home is when he says to the Pharisees, but if, if by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, if it's by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come. It's upon you. And also when we read the Old Testament prophecy about the Spirit being poured out at the end of the age, Jesus read that prophecy when he was on earth, and he said, it's happening now. Today, the scriptures are filled in your presence. It's happening now. And as much as Jesus says, it's happening now, he still says, the bulk of it is yet to come. Jesus teaches what many people call the already, not yet. As Christians, we are an already, not yet people. And it seemed... And already, as in the kingdom is already here, but it's not yet here. There's glimpses of that future reality. It's already here, but it's not yet here full. And it seemed that Apollos was living with a not yet paradigm. And I know for myself, it's very easy to slip into this not yet paradigm. And not give full recognition of the already. Where, yes, God's kingdom does come with human acknowledgement of God's ways, but God himself is breaking his kingdom onto earth. If the train is the kingdom of God, it's very easy for us to think, I make that train go. But we don't. The Christian paradigm of already now says that train has already rolled into town. God is establishing his rule, God is moving and acting, and this is the truth that challenges every other power that stands in opposition to the reality that God is king. The fundamental difference of Jesus' message with the Jewish message is that the kingdom of God is a dynamic power that is unleashed among people today. This is the truth that the baptism of the Holy Spirit celebrates. It's about the presence of God's kingdom in our city. And so after telling these two stories, Luke says, Paul continued to argue persuasively about the kingdom of God. And the first power that is challenged is the power that is behind every other power on earth. So if we go to the next screen, uh, that story that we read in, in scripture, uh, go to the next, next one, there we go. Uh, we see that happening in Ephesus, where at Paul, so those two stories, Paulus and Paul, 
And then we have uh, the story of, uh, we have Paul say he, he argued persuasively about the kingdom of God, and then there's this whole litany of stuff happening where illnesses are cured, evil spirits are leaving people in the name of Jesus, idols were exposed, uh, causing a complete riot in the city. And what's important to point out about what's happening here is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, which the Jews thought was going to happen at the end of time, this recognizable power um, has, has, has come to town, and so that is why the demons are fleeing. That is why the people are being healed. Because there are no demons in the future. There are no sicknesses in the future. It is by the Spirit that we triumph over demonic power. It's by the Spirit that the consequences of evil in this world are reversed. Because in God's future kingdom, when the Spirit is all in all, when the Spirit comes forward to us, it gives us, it, it basically is the future is imposing itself on the present. And the demons must flee. And sicknesses must be healed. And in Canada today, we're okay with religion as long as it's individual and doesn't upset the apple carts of society. But the truth is, that the principalities and powers are alive and well within the fabric of our cities and institutions. And to challenge those powers will involve political and social action. When the kingdom came crashing into Ephesus, it upset the, it upset the apple carts. It upset the ac economic structures of that city. It caused a riot. When God's future kingdom comes crashing into earth, the structures of our society and the governments of our country must and eventually will bow to the rule of God on earth. This is happening now. This is the truth that comes to us with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God's presence is a healing balm in our cities, in, in our church, and in our bodies. If you're sick, you will be healed. You will be healed if you are sick. That is God's promise. God tells us that in His future, that future is sure to come, and your healing, your healing is absolutely sure. Sometimes it happens now on this earth. Sometimes we experience this healing now. And when we do, we must realize that this is a future glimpse of when God's rule will be all in all. It's a future with when Jesus came and the kingdom came crashing into earth with Jesus. Whenever Jesus Whenever Jesus sent demons fleeing, whenever he cured people of illnesses, whenever he raised people from the dead, he did this to display the kingdom of God, about the kingdom of God that was one day going to be here all in all. So God doesn't bring healing to all people in the right now. Um, and when you are not healed, it is not necessarily because you lack faith. If all people were healed, that means the kingdom of God is here in full, and God has decided that that time is not yet. But he brings them already in order to offer us glimpses of the future. To remind people of his promise and, his, and the hope he gives to us that's sure to come. And it, be, it can be difficult sometimes when we're the ones that have an illness. And when we see somebody else healed. It can be especially difficult to hear these people who are healed say things like, God is so good and God is so faithful. Are we to conclude, therefore, that God is not so good to me, and not so faithful to me? It takes a, a level of Christian maturity, I think, to witness someone else being healed, and allow that healing to remind you that one day you too will be healed. In other words, when someone else is healed, and you're not, let it be a sign of your future healing. Let it be truth speaking to the power let it be truth speaking to the power of cancer, so that even when someone passes away from cancer, we have seen the truth that ultimately healing is in store, and that, that was not the last word. The truth that comes to us through, is, it, this is the truth that comes to us with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is the truth that God has already now established His kingdom on earth. He rules in power. This is the truth we, we, we must learn to speak in every power on this earth that stands in opposition to God. We speak this truth 
only in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit now present, and to the glory of the Father. Amen. Pray with me, please. So the team comes forward. <coughs> Dear God, your presence is good. And you are here with us. And we sometimes get glimpses of your presence. And we marvel at what you are doing in our midst. I pray that in those moments that we don't always feel your presence. And in the, when we're particularly feeling the curse, we ask that your spirit would flood into our lives. We, we pray that we will see more of those glimpses, especially when we stand so desperately in need of hearing and seeing your promise. We pray for your power to be unleashed so that we can, we can see glimpses. In a way, sometimes it feels selfish to ask for these glimpses. That we be, that we be the ones that could, that could be the glimpse of that future kingdom. But Lord, that's what we pray for. We pray for your power here on earth. We pray for your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name, bless.
to the message. It's uh, When Love Comes to Town by U2. And they have wonderfully responded and they are going to do this. And my hope is that as we listen to them sing this song is that uh, it will speak to us of the love that God himself brings to us.
to um, ask Dirk to come forward. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we wish to inform you that the Bridge Community Church has accepted the resignation of Andrea Isaac effective immediately. Andrea and the Bridge Community Church have reached an amicable agreement regarding the terms of departure from the bridge. We wish Andrea all the best and the Lord's blessing at this time of transition. In the next couple of weeks, the board will host an evening to have further discussions uh, with the congregation, and the dates and times will follow. Thank you. As Derek said, we have uh, much more to say about this, particularly concerning um, how we've come to this decision and uh, concerning the lessons that we've learned as a board um, and uh, that we believe lessons that we as a church need to learn in all of this. And on that note, we wish to invite uh, the church um, to an evening. We don't know if it's going to be this next Sunday or the Sunday after, but we'll be further communication where we could uh, speak further about this. Um, let's pray. We know, God, that this is difficult news to hear. We ask that your spirit come alongside of us in this moment as we process this news. And as we decide how, Lord, we will, how we will respond to this news, Lord, may your spirit come alongside of us. We wait for your spirit. We wait upon you, God. And I thank you, God, for the meeting that a few of us on the board had with Andrea earlier this week, in which we were all, by the grace and surprise of your Holy Spirit, on the same page. That we were able to speak our appreciation for each other and blessing upon each other. And I continue to marvel, God, at this. I marvel at how your Spirit is at work within Andrea. And I marvel at the Spirit that has been at work within each person that's sitting on the board presently. And I pray that in coming weeks for the unity of this church, I pray that we may all marvel at the presence of your kingdom that has already set up shop in this community. Holy Father, may you continue to protect us by the power of your name. Amen. You can stand to receive parting blessing. As we go from here, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord give you peace. Amen. You are able to go now and, re and, and have coffee and, uh, and uh, fellowship. And <laughs>